Good morning. I am Donna Fagan Pascal, the chair of the Brampton Board of Trade, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to in the conversation with the leaders, Stephen Del Luca, leader Ontario Liberal Party. Over the next few months, it is our intention to meet with leaders of each of Ontario's major political parties in the lead up to the elections scheduled for June 2nd of this year. As we start, please join me in acknowledging the land in which we gather and our commitment to foster renewed relationships built on the foundation of mutual understanding and respect. The Brampton Board of Trade operates in the city of Brampton within the region of Peel. And this region is part of the treaty lands and the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land and other regions along the corridor. Specifically, we acknowledge both the territories of the Ashanabek, the, the Huron Wandak, the Haudenosaunee, and the Ojibwe and the Chippewa peoples, and the land that is home of the Metis. Most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who, excuse me, sorry. Who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. By doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. As participants in today's event, we're coming together as one. We believe everyone is free to be their true self and receive the same respect and opportunities, regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, culture, identity, sexual orientation, beliefs, or language. We hope you will join us in fostering a positive environment to ensure a safe and welcoming space for all. Before we get started, let me take a moment to point out some of the highlights of the platform that we're using this morning. On the left of your screen, you're hopefully, you've hopefully noticed that in taking advantage of the networking and the expo areas of the platform. You'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, the chat is ready and available for questions and chatting. Additionally, you're welcome to ask questions at any time of Jennifer Oldman from our team who's on the line. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Alison Gifford, Senior Manager, Public Policy Canada at Amazon. Thank you to Amazon for being presenting sponsor for this event. Let's welcome Alison, who will then be followed by Todd Letts, the CEO of the Brampton Board of Trade, who will conduct our interview with the leader. Take it away, Alison. Thanks very much, Donna. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, so I'm Alison Gifford, Head of Operations and Supply Chain Policy for Amazon Canada. We are absolutely thrilled to be here today as corporate supporting sponsors for the Brampton Board of Trades in Conversation with Leaders series. In short order, I'll have the privilege of introducing our chief guest for today, Ontario Liberal Leader Stephen Del Duca. But before I do, I wanted to share some information about Amazon's plans and projects for Brampton and Ontario. Over the last decade, Amazon has grown significantly in Ontario and Canada. We've invested more than $9.2 billion in the province, and we employ more than 22,000 employees in Ontario. Um, we have 8,000 employees in Brampton alone. We also have 40,000 Canadian small and medium-sized businesses selling on our platform. To say that Brampton is an important city to us is an understatement. When you drive by our fulfillment centre here, you might see a big building uh, with your packages inside. When we look at our big buildings in Brampton, we see one of the strongest talent pipelines in the country. It's a training ground where the majority of our promotions come from across Canada. Our employees who start at Brampton are at our Brampton site tend to become leaders across Canada and around the world. But as you know, Amazon is more than its retail operations. Ontario is a strategic production hub for Amazon Studios, where we hire local creative business and production teams to make new Canadian content, as well as some of your favorite blockbusters right here in the province. We're also a tech company, and that's where we started out, and we continue to grow as a tech company as well. We have two Canadian tech hubs in Canada, one in Vancouver and one in Toronto, with more than 4,300 corporate and tech employees who are constantly innovating for our company. But we don't just innovate for the company. We've also been given a mandate by on top to be, uh, to be innovators for the planet. That's why Amazon is the largest corporate buyer of renewable energy globally and proud owners of the largest renewable energy project in Canada. It's enough power to power more than 100,000 Canadian homes for a year. Again, we're really pleased to have the opportunity to be here today and to work with such respected partners like Todd and the BBOT crew. And it gives me great pleasure now to introduce the leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario, Stephen Del Duca. 
the Liberal leader was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in September 2012 and has had the chance to serve as Minister of Transportation and as Minister of Economic Development and Growth. In March of 2020, Stephen was elected as the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. Since becoming leader, Stephen has, ha has been focused on strengthening our democracy, improving education, health care, ending the housing crisis, fighting climate change, and building an economy that works for us all. Stephen, his wife, two daughters, and two dogs are proud residents of Vaughan. It gives me great pleasure to welcome today Stephen Del Duca, leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Allison, for your very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to you and the entire team at Amazon for sponsoring this morning's uh, this morning's discussion. Really, really appreciate that. I want to say, Donna, to you and Todd and to the entire Brampton Board of Trade team, how grateful I am uh, to have this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Uh, but most importantly, uh, how much I'm looking forward to the conversation, to the questions and to the back and forth that we're going to have just in a couple of minutes. So as Allison mentioned just a second ago, I won the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party on Saturday, March 7th, 2020. Of course, we all know what took place just a few days after that convention. Uh, the world uh, really turned upside down here in Ontario, right across this country. We entered into our first lockdown. Uh, and over the past couple of years, it has been brutally, brutally difficult for the nearly 15 million people who call our province home. Uh, we've seen, obviously, the back and forth of schools closing and opening. We've seen businesses, in particular small businesses, that have just been so badly battered throughout the, the entirety of all the waves of the pandemic. We've seen our hospital and healthcare system really uh, be strained under the various surges that we've had. We've seen tragic things, horrifically tragic things occurring in our nursing homes right across this province. This has been a really, really tough time. And we're not through to the other side of it just yet. We know that we continue to need to grapple with the Omicron variant. We know that we still have some difficult times ahead of us, but we also know as Ontarians that because we are at our core a hopeful and optimistic people and a resilient people, we know that we will get through this pandemic ordeal, that we will get to the other side of it. And so that's why one of the things that we have to do, and I believe it's the responsibility of leaders to keep one eye on navigating the crisis, but the other one on what a recovery will need to look like. Now, Allison talked about the fact that my wife and I, well, we're raising two young daughters. We live in Woodbridge. So Brampton is a neighbor of mine. I know the community very, very well. Uh, in my time in the legislature, serving as a minister, both of transportation and economic development and growth, I had the honor of spending an awful lot of time in Brampton, which I was delighted to do, to talk about all the challenging <clears throat> needs that the community uh, that the community has in healthcare and education, including post-secondary, and transportation and transit. Uh, and this, to me, is a very important time for your community. You have dealt with some serious challenges, as I said, over the years. But really, when you think about those critically important areas that I just described a second ago, you are really poised to go to the next level right at this moment. Now, I know that, again, there have been some difficult circumstances around whether or not you've had your fair share of support and investment from upper levels of government, as they're called, upper tiers of government. But right now, when you think about your hospital and healthcare needs, you think about what's happening with the various transit discussions around the LRT and various BRTs, when you think about the exciting news that, uh, that Ryerson is looking to develop and build uh, a medical school in Brampton, all of this tells me that you as a community are truly, uh, again, poised to really take off over the next number of years. To me, that's exciting. The province of Ontario will not be successful. We will not thrive. We will not have prosperity if our biggest communities and our smallest towns aren't thriving as well. And given Brampton's location, given your size, given your importance to me and to our entire party and to this province, you need to succeed. But in order to succeed, you need to have a genuine partner at Queen's Park. And yes, a, a genuine partner in the federal government as well. Uh, you know, again, I just want to stress that I am absolutely committed as leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, as someone who is running to be Ontario's next premier, you have my ironclad commitment that I will be that partner, that those women and men who are running under the Ontario Liberal banner in Brampton, including Harinder Mali, Marilyn Raphael, Remy Jaj, and Safdar Hussein, will all work so, so hard to make sure that you have the healthcare dollars and the hospital investments that you need 
to contend with the incredible growth that's still to come, that you will have transit projects that will help take cars off our roads, uh, will also help us with respect to making sure that our environment is clean and that we are confronting the climate crisis, that you'll have the kind of support for that medical school and the post-secondary vision that you have, along with Ryerson for your community, that we will invest in publicly funded education to make sure that our kids are set up for the very best start in life, that we are going to partner with the federal government to deliver $10 a day licensed childcare. To me, it's absolutely appalling that Ontario stands now as the last province in Canada uh, and we still don't have a deal in place. There is so much that we need to grapple with right now, but I just want to stress in the Ontario Liberal Party, uh, Brampton will have a true partner, a partner who understands, partially because I'm a neighbor, uh, a partner who understands why it is so important for the province to make critical investments in healthcare, in education, in an economic recovery that works for all of us, including supports for small businesses, uh, and in all of the other pieces of the puzzle that Brampton needs in order for you to thrive. So I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're about to have. Really grateful for the opportunity today. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. Well, hello, everyone. I am Todd Lett, CEO of the Brampton Board of Trade. And uh, Mr. Del Duca, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And, and thank you, for, should I say, welcome neighbor. Uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, very, uh, articulate, you were very articulate in your opening remarks uh, uh, in terms of understanding uh, Brampton. And uh, I want to echo uh, something you said in your, in your opening remarks. Uh, poised, we have a saying here at the Brampton Board of Trade, Brampton is poised for greatness. And I know that you, uh, you and I have uh, had conversations at Queen's Park. We've walked uh, Go uh, Transit uh, uh, platforms together in Kitchener. And we're just so happy that you're here today uh, to discuss more about your vision uh, for Brampton's growth and Ontario's growth as well. Mr. Del Duca, I'm going to start with a question about small businesses and okay. small business uh, support. Our team here at the Brampton Board of Trade uh, works closely with small businesses. About 75% of our membership are companies that uh, employ under 10 people, our restaurants, stores, personal services. And uh, it's been a rough uh, go over the last uh, 22 months. Uh, just last week, a popular fitness studio made the decision to close their doors. And I worry that we might see more of that before uh, the winter is uh, out. The provincial government just announced uh, some more financial incentives for business, including an extension of uh, uh, payback for the SIBA loans for another year and uh, a 10,000 grant for those businesses that are forced to close. If you were premier, what immediate financial relief would you offer small businesses uh, to recover and, and to accelerate economic recovery? Well, thanks very much for that question, Todd. It's uh, great to see you. Great to hear your voice. Uh, thank you again for the incredible work that you and your team do with the Brampton Board of Trade. And I, you know, I have to say it's uh, it's one of these things that's really been really uh, tough for me to watch over the past couple of years. I, you know, sometimes uh, I don't say this often enough, I suppose, but many, many years ago, my mom uh, ran her own uh, small business at Toronto's iconic St. Lawrence Market. It was, uh, uh, you know, for those who don't know, I'm half Italian and half Scottish. My dad's the Italian one. My mom is the Scottish one. But ironically, her small business at the St. Lawrence Market was an espresso and fresh pasta shop. But, you know, for many, many years, we saw firsthand, I saw firsthand uh, what was required of my mom as a small business owner and operator up really, really early, six days a week, all the way downtown to the St. Lawrence Market, the stress that came with managing that payroll, uh, just, you know, the, the incredible dedication. And we know when you look at all the stats that small business owners, small business entrepreneurs really are such an important, not only component of our economy, but spark uh, that helps to ignite our economy. And so that's why it's been so very tough for all of us to watch. Um, you know, I think, and there have been various moments during previous waves of this pandemic, for example, when when I and others called for additional rounds of the small business grant uh, and a series of other things to help small business owners, for example, uh, be able to procure and purchase personal protective equipment earlier in the pandemic. I think, you know, I can I can assure you that as Ontario Liberals are developing our platform, uh, there is a big component or there will be a big component in our economic platform that touches upon what kind of real relief can we give the small businesses who've been hit the hardest during this pandemic. And it has to be financial relief. One of the things that I hear 
everywhere that I go in the province, whether virtually or in person, is that small businesses are carrying an extraordinary amount of debt. It's true that a lot of things have been delayed in terms of required payments and other payroll taxes and deductions and taxes, but at the end of the day, they're, they are delays. They are not outright cancellations. And so a lot of those bills will come due at some point in time. And I know that that's a real struggle. So we're working on that right now, uh, but I just wanna be clear. I believe that the relief needs to be real. It needs to be significant and it needs to be financial in nature in order to help make sure that our small business entrepreneurs not only survive this horrible ordeal, but actually get through to the other side, can continue to grow, can continue to put people to work, which is what we need them to do. Well, thank you very much for that uh, response. And uh, yes, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. The uh, debt uh, load is certainly has uh, uh, maximized for many uh, businesses and uh, continued financial relief to match uh, what future operating restrictions there may be uh, is really an essential link that has to be made uh, for our economy and for our small businesses to survive and thrive. And let's just explore that a little bit further. You know, when we talk to uh, our small business community, they say, yes, this cash is, uh, is required. But if they had their preference, uh, they prefer to serve customers uh, rather than just receive cash uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the various uh, governments. It has been really difficult for businesses to plan, to forecast. Uh, the supply chain uh, issues uh, magnify uh, that problem. Um, what can would you do differently with respect to breaking the cycle of, of lockdowns, last minute lockdowns, yeah. opening slowly, lockdown again? I think we're in our fourth one now, fifth yeah. wave. Uh, you know, between rapid tests, vaccines, we have lots of other tools to prevent blunt instruments like uh, lockdowns. And uh, if uh, you were you were premier, um, uh, how would you prevent uh, future lockdowns. And the second part of the question is, tell us more about uh, uh, your plan for job creation, not only in Brampton, but uh, uh, but across Ontario as well. Well, thanks for that very, very much for that one as well, uh, Todd. Look, I think I think you you um, you explained it really well. We talk about how brutally tough this has been for everyone across the province and this notion of going back and forth, the whiplash effect, as I like to call it, between the openings and the closings. I think in particular, what's been really hard for so many of us to take is that lack of consistent, clear, coherent messaging and communications, the last second uh, kind of nature of how the information is being provided to the people of Ontario, the, the lack of common sense that it would seem, uh, you know, is missing from many of the decisions that are being made. Uh, and I'm happy to sort of unpack that a little bit more in a second. I, you know, I think back to the very earliest days of the pandemic, and I, I've said this on the record many, many times before, I don't think any level of government, regardless of partisan stripe or any leader can be blamed for having to scramble back in March and April of 2020. Let's even say May of 2020. This came out of nowhere. You know, it caught all of us off guard. We clearly weren't ready uh, to deal or contend with this kind of crisis. That, that does tell me we have to learn lessons from this pandemic to make sure we are resilient enough to withstand future challenges. But we are no longer in the first 90, 100 days of this pandemic. It has now almost been two full years. And I would have thought by now there would have been a series of lessons that our leaders, and of course I'm talking in particular about Doug Ford, would have, would have picked up on by now. And I think one of the most important lessons that I, I believe has been lost I believe that, you know, I, I believe that uh, Doug Ford has not picked up on this one is the notion that as, as hard as it is to accept tougher decisions made earlier, stronger decisions, more responsible decisions made quickly and earlier and then communicated clearly actually prevents or would have prevented, I think, uh, much harder decisions, much tougher decisions uh, that would be announced later on. So. There are there have been a series of occasions during this pandemic where the effort around uh, starting restrictions has been a little bit half hearted, a little bit grudging. Same thing with vaccine mandates. I was the first provincial leader to call for a clear and decisive vaccine mandate for healthcare workers and education workers. The creation of the vaccine certificate. Again, I was the first leader to say all the way back in July of last year. Let's get a province-wide vaccine certificate that's trustworthy, that's reliable. Let's deploy that broadly as soon as possible so that 
we are able. So these are these are the tools. These are the mechanisms. But it's also a style of leadership. It's a style of leadership that I think has been missing in particular uh, since those earliest days of the pandemic. So again, let me just stress stronger. I hate to put it this way, but stronger medicine earlier on decisiveness earlier on, I think would have in many respects made it a lot easier for us to not only withstand uh, the additional waves, but to not have to suffer through as many lockdowns or school closings uh, as we've had to, uh, as we've had to. I'll also point out that I think, you know, one of the best ways to protect ourselves against this back and forth, because don't forget whether it's the schools closing or businesses being locked down or shut down or restricted, all of those moves have been designed to, as they say, preserve our hospital and healthcare system. I, you know, I, I think there were things that should have been done many, many, many months ago. Repealing Bill 124 is a good example. Getting internationally educated nurses and even doctors out of the bleachers and onto the playing field, so to speak, uh, to get them to you know be in a position to help. Uh, calling on the federal government or requesting military help uh, with vaccine deployment, like they did in Quebec. These are all things that again, I believe, you know, would have helped, would have helped a great deal uh, and would have made what we've gone through so far uh, just a little bit easier to take. And I don't think we would have closed as often as we have had we had that kind of responsible and competent leadership that was then communicating all of this clearly with the people of Ontario. Well, thank you for that uh, response, uh, Mr. Del Duca. And um, I, I think you know how quickly Brampton is uh, growing, and you articulated very well in your opening remarks um, a number of infrastructure needs, be it uh, in healthcare, be it LRT, uh, BRT. With seven, a population of about 700,000 now, and we welcome about 16,000 new people uh, every, uh, uh, every year, that growth is continuing. And I'm just looking at some of the comments uh, uh, in uh, our uh, chat here right. uh, about managing that, uh, that growth. Um, regional connectivity, uh, goods movement. Of course, you know that uh, uh, Brampton is uh, Canada's uh, uh, logistics hub. About 40% of what's sold in stores passes uh, through Brampton. So regional connectivity, goods movement, getting to work and getting home uh, again in, in a timely way are uh, really important priorities for Brampton businesses. And, uh, you know, in, in the, the case of Brampton Board of Trade members, the 61,000 employees uh, that, uh, uh, that they employ. Um, you're on uh, record uh, for opposing uh, the GTA West Corridor uh, Highway or Highway uh, 413. It seems like that uh, infrastructure investment would have tremendous return on investment, uh, about uh, uh, $2.3 billion during the five years of construction of income to Ontario workers, and about a billion dollars in GDP boost uh, each year that, uh, uh, that it's operational. That's a lot, uh, that's a big return that could be used to help fund uh, healthcare priorities, uh, other transit priorities. Could you help us understand why uh, you oppose uh, that uh, GTA West Corridor Highway, and yeah. what alternative uh, you would propose in order to help with that regional connectivity? Yeah, it's a great look. It's a great question. You know, I'm not I'm I'm not going to go into a deep dive on on the figures that you cited around the the economic let's call it output that would come from building the infrastructure or once it's operating. I think that you know I learned in my time at MTO there there are a lot of stats that fly around from time to time and. You know, it's hard to know for sure exactly whether or not those are uh, the right way to measure uh, both the positives and the potential liabilities or negatives of some of the stuff that government does from time to time. Some on the call today will will know that I served as Minister of Transportation for three and a half years. Uh, and it was during my time as Transportation Minister that I, I paused the environmental assessment on the 413 because I, you know, I felt uh, that it was a proposed project that had started conceptually within the ministry more than two decades prior to me pausing it. Uh, so that would have been, you know, a, pro a, a project or a, or, or a proposal that started conceptually before we had the green belt, before we had places to grow back in 2006, uh, before we had seen, I'll, I'll call it the, you know, the short, medium and long-term challenges 
uh, that we we now know that we're going to have with respect uh, respect to environmental degradation, the fight against the climate crisis, the advent of electric vehicles. I mean, there's a whole series of things that have changed within the world of goods movement, within the world of transportation, uh, since since this highway project was first conceptualized. So when I paused the environmental assessment, what I said to our team at MTO was, let's take one step back. Let's appoint an independent panel, uh, individuals that have some expertise in this area to do that deeper dive into the process. Uh, was it the very best process? Was the environmental assessment, uh, were the steps that were taken, were they rigorous enough? Uh, let's try to quantify whether or not this will work for the future, whether or not it's required. And that panel report came back to me and their conclusion was unanimous. And it was clear that for the size, the scale and the scope of the investment required uh, for the challenges that we would see with respect to uh, damaging our natural environment uh, up against the the uh, the anticipated savings, if I can put it that way, for commuters, that the project just didn't make sense. Now, fat, so we decided to halt the project altogether uh, at that point in time back in, I think it was 2018. Obviously, the current government, in particular in the last couple of, well, the last few months, the last year or so, uh, they've decided to take up the cause of the 413 with a, a certain vigor that I find to be a little bit curious and a little bit peculiar, I think perhaps motivated more by politics than, than sound planning. Um, but we're in a world now where when you talk about Brampton's challenges in this moment, or Vaughn's challenges, or Mississauga's challenges, or Halton Region's challenges in this moment, with both how our commuters move and how our goods move, I think one thing that's lost in the shuffle about the 413 is, and by the way, we've not seen any clear figures from the current government about this, is what is the overall cost of that project and what is the timeline for that project? So based on my experience at MTO, I feel fairly comfortable telling all of you that the 413 would cost somewhere between 10 and $15 billion to complete in its entirety. And it would take somewhere between 10 to 12 years, best case scenario, to deliver that infrastructure for this region. It strikes me that because our needs are urgent, and by the way, let me just say, I am the only person running for premier who lives in the 905 ring around Toronto. So this is not an abstract conversation for me. The commute that your members face every single day is the same commute that, that I face and my wife faces on a regular basis and my family faces. So. We know how real the challenge is, especially since we've seen transit ridership drop fairly substantially because of the virus. Uh, but to me, waiting 10 to 12 years and spending 10 to $15 billion on a hope that this will actually do what none of the other highway projects have done in the GTA, which is solve the gridlock challenge, uh, to me, it just seems like it makes no sense, especially when you stack it up against the farmland that we're going to destroy, the species at risk that are going to be, you know, further endangered, uh, the fact that we're going to be paving over large chunks of a section of the green belt, and the list goes on from there. What I want to see us do, working provincially, federally, and municipally with Brampton, is what are the shorter term investments that we can make together to make sure that we do give people real alternatives, that we do get more of our cars off the road, that we make transit affordable and accessible that Brampton does get its fair share to help catch up and keep up with the growth that's anticipated, be it the BRTs, the LRTs, the two-way all-day go service that I was uh, responsible for leading on over the past few years when I was transportation minister. Uh, you know, we have other infrastructure in the GTA. Have we fully examined the potential to look at the 407 corridor? We, we all saw, I think, you know, quite shocking for me, during the pandemic, when the 407 went cap in hand to the province of Ontario and said, we need you to give us some relief because we're not meeting our contractual obligations without trying to leverage that, that let's call it that, that vulnerable moment for the 407. Apparently, Doug Ford said, sure, not a problem. We're going to alleviate you of that burden. I think that was a missed opportunity to have that very direct conversation with 407 to say, look, we, we need to figure out what our entire transportation plan looks like for the GTA. GTHA, and you need to be at the table for that conversation. I'm, I'm, for, I'm going to be 49 this year. I just can't believe that the best solution that we have for gridlock is a project that Doug Ford is obsessed with that will not be ready until I'm eligible to collect CPP. Uh, sorry, uh, to, yeah, well, to collect CPP. And it, that's not relief. That's not the relief that we need. So we need something quicker. 
We need something more decisive that balances commuter and goods movement with our environmental obligations. And stay tuned for more details on what kinds of investments I think will get us there. But I'm just convinced it's the wrong project led by the wrong person. Well, thank you very much for that uh, response, uh, Mr. Del Duca. Uh, yeah, the urgency that you um, mentioned in uh, your uh, response, I think, is uh, felt by uh, Brampton businesses and their employees uh, every uh, every day. And uh, uh, again, uh, the uh, the four thirteen is uh, uh, a big project an expensive project with the potential for a big return on investment. It's very confusing, as, as you've mentioned, though, from a, a business person's point of view to um, truly understand uh, which uh, facts and figures uh, to, uh, uh, to believe. And uh, that's why uh, I'm happy to hear that you're uh, looking at alternatives and uh, uh, the urgency of articulating uh, alternatives that are in fact realistic uh, is so important uh, for uh, Brampton businesses in their decisions on how to hire and where to locate, where to expand, et cetera. But just one more follow-up question on, uh, on, uh, on your response because it, uh, uh, you did to touch on it. Um, municipal relations, uh, provincial municipal uh, relations. Uh, right. On this particular uh, issue, um, the northwest part of Brampton is Heritage Heights, and it has the potential to open up 25,000 jobs. And there's an urgent need for those jobs in uh, Brampton. About 152,000 of our residents have to travel outside of the city uh, to uh, their uh, place of work. Um, the um, city has uh, proposed a, a boulevard design that's uh, incompatible. Uh, and if you were, and what that means is those jobs are in limbo uh, for the development of that uh, neighborhood. If, if you were premier, how would you resolve disputes like that? Well, just uh, <clears throat> want to be really clear that, so making sure that I understand it properly. I think when you said it's incompatible, you mean the boulevard concept that the city wants is incompatible with the 413 as a controlled access highway, right? Yes, that's the yeah. stalemate we're at yeah, right now. Well, I mean, the good news is if I'm elected premier June the 2nd, uh, there won't be a stalemate because I'm going to stop the 413. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think that it, and I'm being clear about that. I've been clear about that now for as leader uh, for many, many months. And as I said, as transportation minister, I was the one who led on this when no one else was e even really looking at it on the 413, that is. So I, I am aware of the boulevard concept. I think that it seems to me like a creative solution. Um, I'm, I'd be happy always to work with uh, Mayor Brown and the council and others in Brampton to make sure that we were able to uh, we were able to respond the, to the needs that would help, as you as you pointed out, employ that many people living in Brampton or working in Brampton. Uh, but but under a, a Stephen Del Duca Ontario Liberal government, there would be no incompatibility because the 413 would not proceed. Okay, thank you very much for the clarity uh, in that no response. Let's talk uh, about uh, transit concerns. Gosh, yeah. there are so many uh, uh, infrastructure <laughs> needs that can really uh, uh, boost uh, Brampton. Uh, again, back to your opening comments, we are poised uh, uh, for greatness. And despite uh, a rough couple of years uh, through the pandemic, uh, there is a lot of optimism among our uh, members, among our business uh, community as reflected in our most recent uh, business uh, confidence uh, uh, index. Uh, when you were um, a minister of transportation, uh, you proposed 100% uh, uh, capital funding for the entire uh, here Ontario main LRT that uh, uh, would ha had city council at the time uh, accepted uh, that generous office offer that would have uh, had construction on uh, the LRT right to uh, Brampton Go uh, occurring uh, uh, this year and opening uh, shortly. Um, Brampton City Council did not uh, accept that. They are now exploring two options uh, 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 to continue the extension of the LRT uh, from uh, its current terminus at uh, planned at uh, Steeles all the way to uh, the go. One is a completely surface route. The other is uh, has a short tunnel option. The cost differential is quite significant. Uh, the tunnel option is uh, more than a billion dollars uh, more than the surface. Um, 
my question to you is, can you commit to extending the LRT if elected? And um, what consideration would you give to all of the priorities uh, across Ontario? There are LRT asks in Markham, uh, in Waterloo Region, in, uh, in, in Cambridge. You, you've got a couple of options uh, there, but if you were to be premier, you're also going to inherit a, a debt that's close to $400 uh, billion. How would you uh, give consideration to uh, the cost difference between those two options? And, and, and what is your, your view on the main LRT extension if elected? Well, you'll not be surprised to hear me say, Todd, I still have many, I'll say fond memories of the discussion relating to uh, the the LRT, uh, the Here Ontario main LRT as originally proposed. It was a, you know, I look back on it now and I realize that it was, well, let me just say it was a, it was a tough time. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in the LRT technology, generally speaking, along with BRTs, along with obviously, uh, you know, uh, you know, go and what it can accomplish in subways where they make sense. I mean, because we have not invested enough as a people uh, over the past, well, many decades in all forms of transit infrastructure, and I kind of touched upon this a second ago, we're in this cycle where we have to invest to catch up and on then also keep up because what well, we know, as you pointed out earlier, the growth is, is, you know, people are still coming and we need them to come and we need them to be set up for success. So, you know, I, I am very much looking forward to, uh, I understand what's happening with the LRT. I know that council is still deliberating over a couple of different options. I know that federal, uh, federal representatives have spoken about their willingness to provide a contribution to, to these projects. I think that's all really good news. Uh, I would just say, um, you know, I would just say I, I really do want to make sure if I'm elected premier that Brampton gets its fair share so that it can keep up and catch up or catch up and keep up, whether that's on the LRT or the BRTs that are being talked about and proposed. I want to create as much of a network as possible uh, so that, as I was talking about in my previous answer, so that more people have an easy, accessible and affordable option to take public transit, to get where they need to go, to leave the cars at home which in turn will relieve some of the congestion on our roads to help with our goods movement. So to me, it's the whole package. You know, your other point about the, let's call it the fiscal room that the province will have because of what we've done during COVID and whether or not we can afford all of, all of these projects. I think the question for us, and we don't always look at it this way is, yes, of course, there is a cost to build the project, but what is the, what is the deferred cost or liability if we decide to not do it? You know, if we're not going to do that catching up investment and that keeping up investment, are we just kicking the ball further down the field so that my daughters or my grandchildren uh, there, you know, if I have grandchildren one day, that their generation has to pick up the slack because, you know, the outstanding bill just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's one of the reasons that we are all living with these challenges right now. And so, you know, when it comes to investing in critical transit infrastructure, it will be a priority for Ontario Liberals in Brampton, across the GTHA, across Ontario, because I believe it's the way to go. And so I'm, I'm prepared to make the tough decisions to say, this is worth it for the next generation to get it right, even if it looks like the numbers are large at this point in time. Of course, it always helps to have a willing partner, both locally and federally, uh, on the financial side that doesn't hurt. Uh, the federal government being a willing partner is really good news, but I am convinced that we will be able to provide Bramptonians with the kind of transit that they deserve so that there is that connectivity, whether it's the two-way all day go or it's the stuff we see with the LRT and the BRTs. And I'm looking forward to Brampton Council uh, continuing to deliberate on the LRT options and then working closely with Council in the months and, and years ahead. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, response. Uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement uh, in Brampton, uh, uh, in our downtown, and yeah. uh, your point with respect to having partners municipally and federally with skin in the game uh, to make these many different infrastructure priorities, be it transportation, transit, uh, and healthcare is uh, my, my next uh, uh, question to you, uh, Mr. Del Duca. But having that alignment is certainly something that members of the Brampton Board of Trade have been asking uh, and, and, and encouraging uh, the three, four levels of government uh, with the region as well uh, to work together on these needs that are urgent and uh, will pay big dividends in terms of, you know, our, our, our members look 
at Brampton as Ontario's secret weapon, Ontario's secret <laughs> economic development uh, uh, weapon, because with the proper uh, infrastructure, uh, just watch us uh, grow. The, uh, uh, the, we are definitely poised for greatness. But let's talk about the seriousness uh, of, of the healthcare situation uh, right now. There is some, uh, some optimism uh, with respect to a uh, Ryerson uh, medical school proposal that's uh, currently being supported uh, by this government. Uh, Mayor Brown and uh, council have done a wonderful job of increasing uh, the post-secondary uh, footprint uh, in uh, Brampton, in our downtown, be it Algoma. Uh, Ryerson uh, has some new uh, investments in the Venture Zone and the Cyber Secure uh, Catalyst. Sheridan, of course, uh, the Davis campus is uh, the biggest in the, Sher uh, in the Sheridan portfolio. And we look for more uh, expansions uh, there. What are your uh, thoughts uh, with respect to uh, a medical school? And uh, if uh, your government was elected, would you support uh, a medical uh, school uh, in uh, in Brampton? <clears throat> well, look, I, I've had the uh, the opportunity to speak on a number of occasions with uh, with uh, Mohammed uh, Lashami, the president of Ryerson. I've heard from. Uh, from others uh, in Brampton. I, obviously, I've heard from Mayor Brown, uh, both while running for leader and since becoming leader, about the importance of the right kind of investment. So I'm very open to the conversation uh, to be able to provide support for a medical school in in Brampton. I just I do want to point out, though, this is a this is a really important thing for us to not forget. So a couple of minutes ago, in talking about transit, another form of infrastructure, I said how this is a moment where we can't afford to kick the ball further down the field, you know, to use a, a phrase that we can't afford to miss this opportunity because it just gets worse later on. Um, also a lesson, as I said, throughout the pandemic, you know, making a decisive and responsible uh, decision and showing real leadership helps make things a little bit easier later on. Let's just remember that, you know, three and a half years ago, uh, there was a discussion, a live discussion with provincial investment on the table so that in Brampton and in um, Milton, and in Markham, there would be additional post-secondary campuses that would be built. And so I know that Brampton's made tremendous progress. I'm very, very excited about the conversations and the work that's happening in partnership with Ryerson. But let's not forget that this is now trying to catch up from what I will call a self-inflicted wound. And I mean self-inflicted not by Brampton or by Stephen Del Duca and Ontario Liberals, but a self-inflicted wound because shortly after taking office, as you all know, Doug Ford said he was going to get rid of all three satellite campuses, satellite campuses. So Brampton's, Milton's and Markham's. And ever since then, there's been this sort of accelerated effort to make up for that lost time. So I'm very excited about the future, but this is just my way of pointing out. We can no longer afford to go backwards simply because of partisanship. And I have to say, I think the decision in 2018 by Doug Ford was based exclusively on, uh, on or, or based exclusively on partisanship, which is a mistake. With your growth and Markham's growth and Milton's growth and what we're seeing across this region, we need more and we need it urgently. And you need to have a willing partner at the province in order to make that happen. So full credit to Brampton, to Mayor Brown and the council that have done the work in the post-secondary space you've talked about. Very excited about the potential for Ryerson in a medical school, especially since we know we have a shortage right now on the human resource side within our healthcare system that is truly being exposed during this pandemic. So if we're going to build a, an exceptional healthcare, public healthcare system that is resilient enough to withstand future challenges, we need to make sure we are producing, graduating more doctors, more nurses. We need to make sure they're properly supported. And I do think that creating those spaces and providing additional support for new medical schools and expanded medical schools needs to be part of that conversation and Brampton needs to be at the table for that conversation. Thank you uh, for that uh, comprehensive uh, response. Um, continuing on uh, with respect to um, the success that Brampton has uh, had in increasing uh, its post-secondary uh, footprint, um, we're very conscious uh, because we welcome uh, so many people to Brampton, over 16,000 every year from all around the world. We're very uh, conscious of the experience of international students. Right. And I'm wondering if uh, you uh, would consider what your thoughts are on considering giving the landlord tenant board the resources they need 
to ensure or, and improve the experience of international uh, students in terms of uh, 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 housing, affordable housing. Uh, perhaps there's a, a, a public, uh, I'm just looking at the a question asked in the chat here. Perhaps right. there is uh, uh, room for a public education campaign for international students and landlords uh, uh, to uh, uh, help uh, the experience overall. Your, your thoughts, please, on uh, the experience of international students and what your government might do to enhance that experience uh, uh, for them. Well, look, I think one of the things that's been really uh, kind of heartbreaking to hear about, uh, it's been reported a little bit in media, but not necessarily widely or broadly reported, is you know how challenging it has been for uh, some um, international students that are that are here living and, and learning here in the province of Ontario. And I know, I know, obviously, some of this has been disrupted because of COVID and because of the various closures and lockdowns and the transition that post-secondary has gone to virtual, virtual instruction or virtual learning like the rest of our school system. But there are also stories, um, you know, of extreme isolation, extreme mental health challenges. And sad to say, international students who are here in our province who uh, who've lost their lives over over this, facing difficult circumstances, and the anguish of being far away from home and not properly supported or not feeling like they've been properly supported here in the province of Ontario. So I think we do need to do more. I think we do need to, uh, I'll say, up our game in this regard. I, I don't know enough right now to know whether reforms to the Landlord-Tenant Act or some of those other mechanisms are the best way to go, but it's possible they are. And so, you know, for sure, I'd want to take a look at it. But I just, I, I can't believe when you consider how critically important the international student cohort is to our post-secondary system here in Ontario, and it is critically important, not just in Brampton, but right across this province, uh, it is something that we need to do better on. Thank you uh, for, uh, for that. Um, we're coming to uh, the close of our uh, open session. We've got a couple more uh, questions and I do encourage our viewers uh, to uh, ask uh, questions in uh, the chat. Um, this question is about the next election. Uh, your party is now in third place and traditionally uh, you've benefited from being the clearest alternative on the center left. But now uh, to, you, you have to answer questions about you know, from the, the smaller parties on the left of the spectrum, such as the NDP and, and the Greens. How do you convince, what is your strategy and how do you convince voters that the third place party is the best bet to replace the first place party? Well, you know, I, I don't think everyday Ontarians kind of look at politics that way. I don't, you know, in my experience, um, every single election campaign is, uh, you know, what I'll call a sort of a clean slate. I, th I think that voters go into election campaigns, uh, first of all, uh, not thinking about the past. I really and truly believe most voters in this province want to think about what comes next. You know, which leader, which team, which plan is actually going to give them uh, the progress that they need, the progress that their family needs, give them real opportunity to thrive and to succeed. Um, those of us who are in politics all day long, you know, we kind of get, in, and this is true of some of the media and elsewhere, you know, we get kind of stuck on the who's standing here, whose place is here, how many seats do you have? But it's not like we go into an election campaign and the, the outcome of the campaign is kind of incremental to where we started. When the campaign begins, every party is at zero. Every party is at zero. There are 124 ridings in this province. We are all competing and what I hope will be a healthy clash of ideas, not the simple personal attacks that we've already seen targeting me coming from Doug Ford and Andrea Horvath, but instead a real healthy clash of ideas. I think if we've learned, you know, another important lesson from COVID is that people are tired of politics that only works for politicians. They want politics and elections and government that works for them. The best way to do that is to have that healthy clash of ideas. So I think about the team that, that I and, and we are putting together. I think about the women and men who are running for us in Brampton, like Harinder Mali, Marilyn Raphael, Remy Jaj, and Safdar Hussein, four incredibly talented people who are working so hard right now to make sure that Brampton has real champions at Queens Park after June the 2nd. I think about the team. I think about the plan that we are putting together that will be thoughtful. It will be responsible. It will be competent. I think about my own experience and the experience of that team. And I know 
that you know experience is the best teacher in life and the best guide in life we will be ready should we earn the honor to govern starting on day one so i don't look at this about you know where parties are starting on day one at a campaign we're all starting with a fresh slate a clean slate we're all starting at zero and the politician the politician who takes for granted where they stand heading into a campaign is i think the politician who is being disrespectful to the electorate and i think the electorate can see that and and they will judge that accordingly I want that healthy clash of ideas. I want to talk about where I am prepared to take the province, who we're fighting for, who we believe in, and why we're in this fight. And, and that's what you can expect from me and the rest of our team in the weeks and months ahead. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Del Duca. May I ask one follow-up? Uh, for sure. Have you, you given consideration uh, to a minority uh, government? And is there a scenario where you would allow uh, the progressive conservatives to lead a minority government? Well, listen, I, I think one of the things that most Ontarians expect from their leaders, they don't expect perfection, of course, which you know is understandable, but they do expect a degree of reasonableness and they want us to be able to collaborate across party lines. And so it, I'm not in the habit of saying at the front end of these conversations, well, I just won't work with this party. I just won't work with that party. I, I think it is safe to say, regardless of partisan stripe, if there are women and men who share the passion that I have to deliver on a publicly funded education system that is exceptional and resilient, where my kids and your kids are set up for real success, then I think there's room to work together. Similarly on healthcare, if we're gonna create again, a resilient healthcare system so we can withstand future challenges, and make sure that those hospitals are built in the right places, like in Brampton, that we have the nurses and the doctors that we need. Uh, similarly, on the economic recovery, there's a whole long list of things that I'm passionate about that I think will make a big difference to the people of Brampton and the people of Ontario. So I think working across party lines is actually in the finest of Ontario's traditions. Having said that, and I've said this on the record already, I think we have seen consistently during this pandemic that Doug Ford himself does not have the capacity, does not have the curiosity, does not have the ability to grow any more into the job than he already has. And I feel that he's fallen short and he's fallen short in ways that have actually set Ontario backwards. I've said this on the record before. I do not believe I can support, I can support Doug Ford personally, but if there are people in that party who want to invest in education in the right way and healthcare, have a real plan to confront the climate crisis and protect our environment, and build an economic recovery that's not just for the well-connected few, but is for all of us and is broadly and fairly shared when we create prosperity, then, I, then I'm then i prepared to work with almost anyone. I just don't think Doug Ford is the right person for the job. In fact, he is the wrong person for the job of leading this province, and he's made that abundantly clear. Thank you for your uh, your candid response, uh, uh, Mr. Del Duca. Uh, we appreciate it, that very much. You've uh, tackled a, a broad range of uh, questions uh, here. Our uh, last one uh, from uh, our viewing audience today. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the passion that you have, uh, not only for today's Ontario, but uh, for children, uh, for the future. And uh, the question is about uh, childcare. Now, yeah. child care is very, very important here in uh, Brampton. I say child care, not daycare, because you know uh, yourself that uh, many in our workforce work in shifts. Uh, and the uh, current uh, situation, Brampton, is that uh, we have one of the highest uh, monthly rates of uh, child care in uh, the country and one of the lowest coverage uh, as well, parents uh, needing uh, child care, maybe one in, uh, in five are able to find it in an affordable uh, way. Can you tell us a little bit more, please, about uh, what your plan would be for child care uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the current status uh, with respect to uh, uh, the, uh, the offer from the federal government? You mentioned that in your opening, in opening remarks. What is your stance on, uh, on child care? Yeah, so first of all, let me just repeat what I think I said a little bit earlier in the conversation today. It is appalling. I mean, it's we Doug Ford should be ashamed of the fact that we are now the only province in this country that has not made the effort to get a deal done with the federal government. I you know, I keep reading in media that we're close. I keep from Doug Ford. I keep hearing that you know, he just wants the best deal. He just wants this, he just wants that. I for the life of me can't understand how every other territorial leader and premier 
was able to get a deal done that will help deliver $10 a day licensed childcare to their families. And families here in Ontario, families in Brampton, have just been totally abandoned by Doug Ford. With each passing day, with each passing week, that is a delay in the relief that hardworking families need in Brampton and need across Ontario. Last May, May of 2021, I released the Ontario Liberal Plan for Child Care. We call it Care for Every Child. There are five key elements in our plan. The biggest one, of course, is to leverage a partnership with the federal government. In our plan, by the end of 2024, a very ambitious time frame, we would deliver $10 a day licensed child care to families right across this province. You pointed this out. You know, just think about the pocketbook relief the cost of living relief for Brampton families, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, after tax dollars, uh, that they would uh, no longer have to pay for childcare so that they could work, whether it's shift work or let's say non-shift work. Uh, our plan also talked about uh, the need to uh, support early childhood educators to make sure we have enough in the system so that the system that we wanna build with the federal government would be properly staffed. We talked about the creation of 160,000 new spaces right across the province of Ontario. Obviously, a large number of those would be dedicated to fast-growing communities like Brampton. And there's other points that are included in our plan. Fundamentally, uh, if there is not a deal done between Doug Ford and the federal government by the time of the next election, and I earn the honor of becoming Ontario's next premier, this will be one of my top priorities. And I am convinced within the first 100 days, I'll be able to get a deal done, probably quicker than that. I'll be able to get a deal done with the federal government and we will start providing immediate relief uh, to hardworking cash strapped families while at the same time giving our kids the very best start in life. Wow, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Deluc. Uh, uh, again, very thoughtful, comprehensive uh, uh, responses. Your passion uh, for the road ahead is uh, is strong. Uh, you articulate uh, the uh, responses to um, a wide range of issues, as I mentioned uh, earlier so well. Thank you uh, for uh, your preparedness uh, for today's conversation. Thank you for your thoughtful, passionate response. And uh, we wish you uh, well uh, in the days, weeks, and uh, and months ahead. Um, I'm going to turn it over now. Uh, well, what, what am I, do you have any final uh, comments or, or remarks uh, that you'd like to leave uh, uh, our viewers with? And then I'd like to... Uh, uh, hand it over to Donna for some closing remarks. Well, for sure. I just really want to express my gratitude once again, Todd, to you and to Donna and to Allison and to everyone at the Brampton Board of Trade, all your members, all your staff. I, I know the past couple of years have been really hard to deal with, but I also know that the Board of Trade uh, Chamber of Commerce network that we have right across this province really has consistently stepped up with thoughtful ideas, uh, very helpful guidance for leaders at all levels and all stripes. Uh, keep up the great work. I always love my time with Bramptonians and with the Brampton Board of Trade. I'm really looking forward to being back physically in Brampton. Hopefully we'll get a chance to see each other really soon. And I just want you to know that I am going to work relentlessly hard with our entire team, in particular our Brampton candidates, to make sure that Brampton's families have real champions at Queen's Park and that you are poised for that greatness that we've talked about. Not just poised for it, but that working together we actually get the job done and deliver for Brampton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Ontario Liberal Leader Stephen DeLuca for your time today and to Allison and Amazon uh, for, their, uh, for being our presenting sponsor. Two of our signature events are coming up in the next months and I would love to tell you more about them. Uh, join us on February 8th, uh, our annual State of the City uh, address. You'll hear from the city's mayor, uh, Patrick Brown, and yours truly. Uh, we will uh, share our perspectives on Brampton's future from a public sector and a private sector point of view. We will also show appreciation for Peel Region's finest, awarding the Peel Region Police uh, Service Award. We celebrate International Women's Day, not enough coffee this morning, uh, by coming together to be inspired and encouraged while hearing the stories of uh, female leaders in our community at our annual event, Inspire Her. And join us on March 2nd, where we'll be awarding the Nassim Samani Memorial Leadership Excellence 
award to Dr. Janet Morrison, president and vice chancellor at Sheridan College. As we look ahead into the spring, we are very excited to be hosting the 2022 Business Excellence Awards on May 5th. We are planning to be in an in-person event based on provincial guidelines at that time. And we are excited to see you all uh, for this uh, occasion. As we wrap up today, I'd like to invite you to stay and network. On the left side of your screen, you'll see the icons for the Expo to Explore. The networking icon will take you to the one-on-one -on -one networking and the sessions icon will take you into group discussions with fellow attendees. Stay in chat and build your network. Thank you for joining us today.